Northern Vancouver Island, a remote aerial odyssey, tracing one of the world's great wilderness frontiers. A home to protected sea life. We've been studying these whales 40 years now, and we've learned a lot. Recovered regalia of the region's first settlers. We had a great celebration when these pieces were returned. And West Coast ceremonial traditions that live on. Our belief as traditional people is that we're connected to all living things. Now, we reveal the coastlines like never before, unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. Canada, over the edge. On the northern extremity of Vancouver Island, the waters of Johnston Strait stretch more than 100 kilometers to the north. Located far from British Columbia's urban centers, this is a remote stretch of coastal beauty. Often shrouded in mist and fog, rolling hills and dense forests line this marine perimeter. With just five kilometers separating Vancouver Island from the mainland, Johnston Strait is a key navigation route, a sheltered waterway for vessels heading for Vancouver to the south and Alaska to the north. It is also home to an incredible marine ecosystem. This is Robson Bight Ecological Reserve, a protected waterway measuring more than 5,000 hectares. In the distance lies one of the world's best-known populations of orca whales. Measuring five to eight meters in length and weighing as much as six tons, the orca, or killer whale, has come to symbolize the natural life of this region. It's a formidable, unique creature. Families of orca bond their entire lives as many as four generations seen together at any given time. Next, the tiny outpost of Telegraph Cove. Originally a communications hub, this was the northern terminus for the Campbell River Telegraph Line. The town grew into a fishing and forestry community with boardwalks connecting these century-old buildings. Today, it is the last of its kind on this coastline. With just 20 full-time residents, Telegraph Cove is now an ecotourism destination. The Telegraph Cove is kind of this funny little place. It's uh, very small. It's hidden away, hard to kind of get to. We're at the north end of Vancouver Island. It was a little sawmill town for most of the last century. A lot of these coastal communities that had wooden boardwalks slowly disappeared and melted basically back into the ocean and the forest. Telegraph Cove survived mainly because of tourism. We had the whale watching and there's the bear watching now. And so all these different enterprises slowly built up over the years. When the commercial fishing and some of the logging industries have had a, a pretty tough time. So, so that's why the cove survived.
The town is steeped in history. At the end of Telegraph Cove's boardwalk lies one of its favorite attractions. The Whale Interpretive Center features the community's history, marine exhibits, and a rare opportunity to see bones and skeletons of otters, dolphins, eagles, and killer whales. One of the reasons for the Whale Interpretive Center here at Telegraph Cove was uh, it was a recommendation of the Johnson Strait Killer Whale Committee that there be somewhere where we could try to educate people about uh, whales and the wildlife that, uh, that did live in this area. We've got a great collection of skeletons. We've got lots of things for kids in the museum so they can uh, come in and have fun and learn and uh, they can touch things, which is really nice. Uh, if things aren't all hidden away in glass cases and that where they just look, they can actually feel a, a whale bone. They can uh, look at the aquarium with a fish in it right up close. We've got great plans for the future. We've got lots of skeletons to put together yet, and uh, it'll be many years before everything's done. The biggest uh, reason for it all, I think, is to try and educate people about the amazing ocean life that lives around the north end of Vancouver Island. From Telegraph Cove, we head offshore to experience an incredible array of life, a thriving habitat for the world's most amazing creatures of the sea. Set between Campbell River and Port Hardy, Telegraph Cove is one of Vancouver Island's most isolated communities. Jim Boroman has been guiding visitors here for more than three decades. It is his home and his passion. The area we're in right now is, a, is a, an amazing archipelago of, of hundreds and hundreds of islands, which give us uh, amazing protection from the weather. It's become this uh, mecca for wildlife more so in the last few years. Uh, underwater, the marine ecosystem is uh, one of the most prolific invertebrate marine life areas in the world. What creates a lot of this life is the high currents that are funneled back and forth through all these channels uh, from shallow to deep water and they create these uh, high current ecosystems which uh, feed uh, your, a lot of your life underwater with plankton. We've got stellar sea lions and harbor seals. Uh, those are a really good chance we can show you uh, these northern uh, sea lions. They're the largest species of sea lion in the world and there is a haul out fairly close to us. They work uh, very closely with uh, uh, the, the whole ecosystem. A lot of the food that they eat are uh, predators of juvenile salmon, so they're very valuable to keep salmon alive and keep the populations of salmon healthy. These are large animals. Some of them can weigh up close to one ton. Uh, and they call them lions because they growl. They don't bark like the California sea lions. They growl like a lion. What I'd love to show you today um, it would be, we've got a possible chance to see the Pacific white-sided dolphins. They're absolutely amazing to watch. Uh, the report is there could be several hundred of them. Uh, 
Aha. Okay, we're looking good. We've got uh, a big school of, of dolphins. This will be very cool. These dolphins we're approaching right now, they are something everybody can relate to. They're just these beautiful little animals that roar around out here in the ocean. These dolphins are more than two meters long, weighing more than 130 kilograms. They can live more than 40 years. They don't slow down very often. They seem to be feeding or traveling at high speed all the time. And uh, they, everybody thinks they love people because they come to the boats all the time. And uh, we're never quite sure why they do that, but they, they, they spend a lot of time riding in your waves. A great species to watch. Uh, one of the things that's really neat about this group is there's a lot of brand new young calves in this group that are uh, riding right along beside their mums. And uh, that's very positive to see that. Um, they're quite a bit smaller still, so I would, I would guess they've been born fairly recently this year. And they're just, I think they're feeding. They're, they're doing a lot of backwards and forwards things, and then they'll race along and stop and dive and, um, and then kind of disappear underwater for a little bit. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The other thing that um, they're certainly uh, feeding is the humpback whales. And this is probably one of the brightest uh, things to happen on the Pacific coast in many, many years. Since the days of commercial whaling, when they slaughtered these whales to near extinction, uh, they have been making a comeback in a huge way in the last decade. There were years we didn't think there were any going through the area at all. Uh, we would get the odd report from some of the people and researchers in the area, but there were many years we wouldn't see a, a humpback whale ourselves. I can come out from Telegraph Cove right now almost any given day from spring through summer and right into late fall, and there's probably not very many days when I can't find several humpbacks feeding in this area. It's spectacular. We'll just poke our head around uh, the corner here at this point. We had a couple of humpback whales here a while ago. We'll see if they're still... Oh, breach! <laughs> the people that were here last week were dying to see that. We never saw anything like it until this guy here. Look at, he just did it again. Look, look at him. <laughs> we don't see that very often. The humpback is massive, 15 meters long, and weighing 36,000 kilograms. Scientists believe it is a highly intelligent creature with complex communication systems and a 25,000 kilometer migratory route. In feeding season, the whales eat one ton of food per day, using their thick strands of hair like a strainer, catching plankton and small fish. It is a unique feeding system and one that makes for a rare display. It's a really interesting situation we get occasionally and it's these Pacific white-sided dolphins that have been swimming around the boat and the humpback whales the humpbacks go through a big ball of herring with their mouth open, and there's quite a bit of spillage. The, the, the herring get bounced all over the place. Some of them get killed, 
they're floating around and the, we know that the dolphins will come in and they'll pick them up. What happens is the humpback starts to make these trumpeting sounds on the surface especially. <whistles> or bugling we call it. And we think the, the humpback's irritated by this behavior of the dolphins. They're kind of getting mobbed. So we're not sure if they're trying to, to get a free meal off the humpbacks or if it's just a pestering situation. But from our perspective, it's, uh, it's neat to watch it. You see a lot of surface activity. I think probably a lot of people are, uh, are attracted to one is their beauty, and they're mysterious. Uh, we've been studying these whales uh, post uh, whaling era for 40 years, more than 40 years now, and we've learned a lot about their habits, their behaviors, the humpback songs, we know a little bit about that, the sounds the killer whales make when they're uh, communicating with each other, that's how they stay in touch but there's so much we don't know. There's a huge void. Every time we learn one thing, it opens 10 more doors and then asks at least another 100 questions. They're a barometer for the, uh, the oceans uh, that they live in. They, uh, they, they sort of represent the good side of life underwater. Located two kilometers off Vancouver Island, Cormorant Island is home to just over 500 people. It is a vibrant community, home to the Numgees people and part of the Kwakwakawak First Nation. Life changed here forever in 1921 when police raided a nearby potlatch or First Nation gathering, seizing sacred regalia, an attack on the Kwakwakawak people. Today, some of that honor has been restored. Not far from the world's tallest totem pole, the regalia, surrendered under duress, is part of a proud collection at the Umista Cultural Center. From 1884 till 1951, a potlatch was, was against the law, uh, according to the Indian Act. And in 1921, my father had a potlatch. People were arrested, tried, and uh, some were sent to jail. 26, I think, were sent to jail. They agreed to give up all their masks and things they used in a potlatch, and then promised not to potlatch anymore until the law was changed. They thought that our people were heathens, uh, believing in something other than, uh, uh, than what the church believed in. I think it was uh, probably uh, an idea by the government to uh, separate us from our ceremonies, separate us from our language and uh, uh, our customs. In the early 70s, our people started to work on repatriation of the Palas collection and uh, up until 1980 when uh, the federal government agreed to uh, return uh, their part of the collection if we built a, a facility that could properly uh, house uh, the collection. And we had a great celebration uh, when these pieces were returned. Uh, and of course, when people go into this building, our people especially, uh, they feel that the spirits of our, of our old people uh, are, are here with us today. Uh, so it's a very, very special place for our people. Here you see the, uh, this part of the Potlatch collection. And uh, the collection is, is uh, 
place, just probably the way the collection, uh, the pieces would be used in our ceremony. These are said to be uh, cannibal bird masks that are uh, uh, said to be servants of the cannibal spirit who lives in the north end of the world. And uh, the, the, dance, the dance is uh, about a young man who uh, goes into the forest and gets possessed by the cannibal spirit. These masks that you see over here are, uh, are used in what we call the uh, peace dances. These are more fun, fun type uh, uh, part of our ceremonies. So this is the way uh, we used to uh, uh, pass on our history uh, is through the uh, potlatch ceremonies where we invite people to witness what's being done and uh, they in turn remember uh, tell other people about what they witnessed at the potlatch ceremony. For Chief Cranmer and the Kwakwakawak people, the regalia collection in the Umista Cultural Center is at the heart of their community. Not far away, in Alert Bay's traditional big house, the legacy of the regalia lives on. Through the work of the Zatzatzla Cultural Group, young people specializing in First Nations dance. We are the Kwakwakiwak people. We speak the Kwakwala language, and there's 18 tribes that we represent here on the northern tip of Vancouver Island. This is a rare opportunity for visitors to experience the rich traditions of Alert Bay's Big House, often closed to the public. Today, you're standing in our big house. We dance on a dirt floor. We have a fire in the middle of the floor. The smoke of the fire will take away any negative or bad energy and bring it to the Creator. It is a rich palette of culture and history, drawing local people and visitors alike to experience this unique cultural display. We created the group to travel to cultural gatherings, canoe gatherings, anything that was positive, we would bring our cultural group there. And then about seven years ago, we changed it into cultural tourism. So we invite people into our house and we want to educate them and tell them our story from our, who we are and let people know that we're alive and well and we still have a culture that's intact even though we live in 2012. The dances approved by local elders are said to remain unchanged since being revealed by the Creator generations ago. teaching young people not only how to sing and dance, but the history, the traditional values, the traditional beliefs that we have, our spiritual laws are very important in today's world. And we see products of success through our young people because they're vibrant and they feel good about themselves. And they have joy in their faces when they're cruising around, not only in this house, but in the bigger world. The dances draw on legacies of the past, including traditional red cedar bark ceremonies and ceremonial peace dances.
The most important dance of all is the sacred cannibal dance, a reenactment of a young man possessed by a cannibal spirit from the north end of the world. Through the course of the dance, the songs and rituals bring this young man back to his human self. Today, we always, when we share dances from our treasure box, we always share dances that connect us to the spirits of either things from the sea or we connect to things from the sky, the elements of the world like the weather, um, the fish that swim in the waters. It always shows a connection. Our people, our belief as traditional people is that we're connected to all living things. The group was formed 15 years ago and embraces members of all ages, from infants to seniors. The hope is that Alert Bay's youth will carry these traditions into the future. My belief is that I grew up in culture. A lot of the people in my age bracket, the ones that stay close to culture, are the ones that are successful today in our world. And our grandparents and our parents invested in us. Even though when we were growing up, we thought, oh, well, I don't really want to dance and act silly. But ever since I've been involved in culture, it's been evident that it's the strength and it gives us confidence and to live in the world that we live in. Our young people that we connect to, they know, they know who they are and they give us strength and we give them strength. So in my heart, this is my purpose in my lifetime, is to carry on in our traditional way and teach it to our young people from a true place. And because we're spirit beings, that's why we come to this house. It nurtures our spirit so that we can live and help in the bigger picture of life. Ten kilometers west of Cormorant Island lies Vancouver Island. Here, the waters widen, and Johnston Strait becomes Queen Charlotte Strait. Far below lies the town of Port McNeil. This is one of the few communities along this remote stretch of coast. It is home to more than 2,600 people, the hub of Northern Vancouver Island. The serene setting is surrounded by mountains, rainforests, and tiny islands.
Fort McNeil is named after Boston-based explorer William Henry McNeil of the Hudson's Bay Company. He first arrived in 1830, sailing 19,000 kilometers around Cape Horn on a fur trading expedition. The area was later settled in the 1930s as a logging camp. As forestry developed along the coast, Port McNeil became the main center of logging operations for the area. Today, that tradition continues. The waterfront is a constant buzz of activity. Barges regularly transport logs to pulp and paper mills in the south. Port McNeil supplies 8% of British Columbia's total harvest, and the industry employs more than a quarter of the town's residents. Further north, this is Port Hardy, the northernmost settlement on Vancouver Island. Once a blue collar town, many believe Port Hardy's future is green with Northern Vancouver Island quickly gaining a reputation as one of the world's unexplored wilderness gems. Port Hardy is the gateway to that region, marking the end of Vancouver Island's highway system. The ferry terminal and small air fleet are the only connections to points beyond.
heading west, cross country, signs of human civilization are left behind. Much of northern Vancouver Island's interior is uninhabited. Dense forests and a maze of narrow winding waterways. Beyond Marble River Provincial Park, the waters of Quatsino Sound widen. Remote gravel beaches run for kilometers. Finally in the distance, the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean comes into view. Along the northwest coast of Vancouver Island, with all its wonders stretching as far as the eye can see. Next, we head south along one of Canada's most barren coasts, high above rugged marine perimeter and even more incredible sea life. Vancouver Island's western coastline stretches more than 300 kilometers, but is home to just a few thousand people. The northern region is nearly void of human presence, a stunning stretch of rocky shoreline. Along the coast, sea arches and sea caves dot the horizon. Vancouver Island has the highest concentration of caves in Canada, with more than 1,000 chartered on the island.
They are an eerie window into the past, a shelter for animals, plants, and insects over thousands of years. In the distance, Cape Cook, named after explorer Captain James Cook, looms on the horizon. And just offshore, an even greater spectacle. This is Solander Island, a small ecological reserve, a sanctuary for sea life. Including nesting cormorants and puffins. And on rocks adjacent to the island, California and stellar sea lions have used this as a stopping place for generations. Back on shore, Brooks Peninsula is a geological anomaly, one of the few regions to remain ice-free during the Ice Age. Today, it is home to rare plant species and unique geological formations, a rare case study for scientists. Beyond Brooks Peninsula, scattered islands dot the landscape for more than 20 kilometers. The Bunsby Islands are a favorite, set in the Chaklisit Bay Ecological Reserve. It is a natural wonder and a rare chance for a close-up view of whales, sea otters, and the mighty bald eagle. Further, 
the Mission Group Islands are a smattering of rocky outcroppings. Inaccessible by land, the area surrounding these islands is a destination for offshore explorers. With awesome coastal mountains and dense rainforests as a backdrop, this is considered one of the world's top sea kayaking destinations. Timeless beauty and solitude in the sheltered waters of Vancouver Island's remote marine perimeter. Finally, Nootka Island and Nootka Sound mark the end of this coastal chapter. With Nootka, a possible translation of the First Nations expression, a place to go around. It was here that European exploration first began. The Spanish passed through in 1794, but it was Captain James Cook who first landed in 1778, naming the island and the body of water. From the spectacular human settlements of Telegraph Cove on Vancouver Island's northern coastline, to the offshore cultural treasure of Alert Bay on Cormorant Island, to the natural habitats of the island's stunning wildlife. This stretch of Vancouver Island continues to be an offshore ethereal wonder. It is hundreds of kilometers of seldom seen wilderness along one of the world's untouched frontiers. preserved beauty that lives on in this formidable coastal region. Here on the edge of Canada. <laughs>